Our next speaker is um, Dr. Sanchita Roy Chowdhury. She's an associate professor in the Department of Pathology at MD Anderson uh, Cancer Center. She did um, her anatomic pathology uh, residency at the NCI uh, and then later a uh, molecular genetics pathology uh, fellowship at Memorial Sloan Kettering. She is a um, national expert on uh, cytology and she's going to discuss with us the cytology and management of small biopsies in lung cancer um, and, and hopefully explain why pathologists are thoracic oncologists' best friend. Hello. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for being here. And while I wish this meeting was in person, I'm glad to be here virtually. And hopefully at the end of the session, there's going to be a question and answer, um, and it'll be a little bit more interactive. So um, I'm a pathologist. I do cytopathology and molecular pathology at MD Anderson. And today I will be talking a little bit about the management of cytology and small biopsy specimens for lung cancer patients. So no relevant disclosures. And um, let's move on to the introduction, which is um, something that we are all quite well aware of um, that the management of lung cancer has been constantly evolving and in the last couple of decades it has definitely made a paradigm shift in how we diagnose and manage these patients. So from a pathology aspect um, we have definitely moved on from being just um, collecting tissue for diagnosis um, or classification of lung cancer but also being well aware that this tissue is being constantly needed for downstream testing for biomarkers that are critical for patient management. So biomarker testing for key analytes are now standard of care for lung cancer. And this um, figure gives just a snapshot of what we're currently doing in terms of managing these patients. Um, of course, there are the FDA-approved therapeutics, including the EGFR mutations, ALK, ROS1 uh, rearrangements, BRAF mutations, ENTRIC, um, MET, exon 14 skipping mutations, RET fusions, and then there are the more um, emerging markers and um, immune oncology markers that are being pursued in terms of providing different options for these patients. So there's a long list of things that we are required to do in pathology um, that will ultimately guide how that patient is being treated. And often, the tissue that we are testing on are limited volume specimens, or otherwise known as your small specimens. And these would include your core biopsies, your FNA samples. And um, the reason we're getting these small specimens, of course, are because most of these patients are diagnosed at an advanced stage, so they're not getting surgically resected. And often, these are the only specimens we have available that are not just used for the diagnosis, but some of the biomarker testing that are required for treating them. So it's critical to be able to do all of our biomarker testing on these small specimens. Now, the important thing to realize is that small specimens doesn't necessarily mean it's an obstacle to biomarker testing. And these specimens actually provide excellent substrates for testing. However, it's also important to realize that there are multiple pre-analytic factors um, that come into play while the specimen is being collected or processed that can impact the tissue quality and the success of downstream testing. So just to emphasize what I just said, that small specimens doesn't necessarily mean they're an obstacle. So let's take a quick look at what we mean by small specimens. So these can be acquired by many different ways. And um, from a lung cancer um, specimen collection standpoint, these usually mean either um, percutaneous samples that are collected either by CT or MRI or ultrasound guidance most frequently core needle biopsies or fine needle aspiration specimens, or they mean um, transbronchial and bronchial samples that would include your EBIS guided FNAs, bronchial brushings, washings, lavages, um, and more recently we're getting these small biopsies. 
Um, for metastatic lesions, um, we could also get ultrasound-guided endoscopic uh, samples. Again, usually FNA, sometimes small biopsies. And then there is um, your biopsy or aspirations that are done by palpation for more superficial lesions, punch biopsies um, uh, from the skin, and then the effusions or body cavity fluid samples. So take, let's take a quick look at these small specimens and um, the different kinds of specimens that we get in pathology. So when I talk about the specimen type, we're either referring to the cytology specimen, which would include your aspiration ones, which are your FNAs, or your exfoliative ones, which would include fluids or um, washings. Um, um, it also includes histology specimens, which is your usually core biopsies, forceps biopsies, any small biopsies. And then as far as the specimen preparation type, um, for your biopsies, it's always your FFPE specimen, as shown here at the bottom, um, the core needle biopsy, or your cytology specimens, which could come in many different flavors. You could have direct smears, you could have cytospin preparations, liquid-based cytology, um, and then your formal and fixed um, cell block preparations. And the question always comes is that, um, should we get an FNA specimen or should we get a core needle biopsy specimen? And the debate continues in terms of which is a better specimen, which is superior, which gives you more material for diagnosis um, and biomarker testing. However, to me, um, these specimens typically are complementary, and um, each one has its advantage and limitation when it comes to biomarker testing. So taking a look at the biomarker angle, when you look at an FNA specimen, the main advantage um, you get is the fact that you're able to do a rapid on-site assessment on these specimens. So when you can do an on-site evaluation while the specimen is being collected, it is so much easier to get an adequate sample and triage it, um, and that's one of the biggest advantages you have when you do an FNA. The other advantage we have that not a lot of people are fully aware of is the fact that the sheer nature, the inherent nature of an aspiration is that you tend to aspirate more tumor cells and less stromal tissue. So your tumor fraction in an FNA sample tends to be much higher than you would have in a core biopsy. It's also um, um, something that doesn't get decalcified. So if you do an FNA from a bony metastatic lesion, um, there would be no decalcification, and so you get better quality nucleic acids. Um, and then in general, if you are not using your cell blocks, but you're using anything that's a non-cell block cytology, so your smears, your cytospin preparations, your liquid-based cytology, all of those don't have the formalin fixation artifacts, and so you get much better quality nucleic acids. On the other hand, um, if you're looking at the core needle biopsy, you, it's a bigger needle, so you tend to get a little bit more tissue, so you get an overall higher DNA yield. Um, as I mentioned, um, you tend to also get not just the tumor cells, but the intervening stromal tissue, the inflammatory component. So if you are doing biomarker testing where you need to assess for the stromal or inflammatory component, um, the core biopsy would be a better specimen to test. The um, added benefit is that since these are formally fixed and paraffin embedded, you can get multiple sections, and those are easy when you're trying to validate or do diagnostic testing for um, your IHC markers or other molecular tests. So some um, somewhat went over uh, these uh, different specimen preparation types, but just to reemphasize, um, the different prepara specimen preparations give you different advantages and disadvantages. And so if you're looking at core biopsies or cell blocks, which are both formal and fixed paraffin embedded tissue, um, the biggest advantage, as I mentioned, is that you can get serial sections. Um, these are easy to validate, and so just the ease of use make them um, the specimen source of choice in many molecular labs. The problem with these is mainly the fact that you are unable to do an adequacy assessment at the time of acquisition of the specimen, 
And so often they may have low amounts of tumor or no tumor or a lot of necrosis and uh, may not be adequate for testing. So um, the other problem is that you're fixing in formalin, and as I mentioned, those tend to give you lower quality nucleic acid. And then finally, when you're cutting sections, these are usually four or five micron sections, so you're not getting the entire nucleic acid content from the whole nuclei when you cut sections of cells. Um, in contrast, smears uh, from cytology give you an advantage where you can do an on-site assessment, you can ensure at the time of the procedure you're getting adequate material. Also, these are not formalin fixed, so you get better quality nucleic acid, and you're getting the whole cell with the entire nuclei, so you get a higher DNA yield content from um, these preparations. The problem with smears is that, one, you need the technical skill and the expertise on-site to prepare the smears, um, process them accordingly, um, and, and then you have many different ways of processing, so there may be variable yields from these specimens. And then one of the biggest problems is that anytime you're using a non-standard uh, preparation for any test, that needs to be um, validated in the molecular lab, and not all labs are validated to run testing on these um, alternative um, preparations. Also, the fact that once you use this specimen, um, if you're going to um, utilize one of the smears, you're going to destroy the smear in the process, so you'll have to sacrifice that from your file. So you have to ensure that you're either digitally archiving the slide or you have some representative material as um, for medical legal purposes. Same thing with the liquid-based cytology. These have the advantage that they are, you have good preservation, you have good nucleic acid content, you get entire nuclei, better yield. But the problem, again, is one, you can do um, on-site assessments in these samples, so you kind of lose that advantage of the adequacy. And second, um, you would have to do an additional validation because it's not your FFPE sample. So let's move on to what I mean by biomarker testing in these specimens. So in a clinical setting, when we're talking about biomarker testing, we're either talking about the nucleic acid-based test, so DNA or RNA-based testing, or protein-based testing. And most DNA RNA-based testing involves some kind of PCR amplification or sequencing um, or in situ hybridization. Um, the most common protein-based testing that we do in the lab is, of course, the immunohistochemical testing. And um, all of these tests are currently employed in biomarker testing for lung cancer. So as I mentioned um, for um, the DNA, um, the second thing I mentioned was um, in situ hybridization. And um, for the longest time, um, ALK and ROS1 fusions were being tested by fish. Um, the testing requirements for fish are a little different than uh, mutation analysis, where um, it's sort of assay dependent. You're not so concerned about the tumor fraction, but as long as you're able to recognize malignant cells by DAPI, um, that's all that's needed so that you can count the signals in the tumor nuclei. Um, both ALK and ROS1 are break apart probes, so you're able to look for the probes in the malignant um, tumor cells. And lastly, um, biomarker testing by immunohistochemistry. Again, um, anytime we're using IHC for biomarkers that will be used for patient management, um, there is a critical need that these markers are validated appropriately. Um, there are guidelines from the College of American Pathologists that guide how um, the analytic validation for these biomarkers are done. And currently, we have um, antibodies for ALK, ROS1, uh, the BRAF V600E mutation, PDL1, Entric, um, MMR proteins. So, all of these, which are relevant biomarkers in lung cancer, can be currently tested using IHC markers. So multiple factors impact tissue quality. I've already mentioned that. And there are multiple steps um, in the process from when the tissue is collected in the patient um, till it's processed and we are um, 
reviewing it and then sending it for the downstream molecular testing analysis. And there are several factors in all of these different steps that play a big role in how that tissue quality will be and how it will behave for some of these tests. And while all of these steps from the tissue acquisition to processing and handling and biomarker testing and interpretation, they're sequential, but they are all kind of interconnected. And um, I'm going to kind of highlight some of these factors that will that play a role in how um, the quality of the tissue impacts um, biomarker testing. So let's start with specimen acquisition. The first step is to collect an adequate sample. Biomarker testing works best when you have an adequate sample. And this is especially true in context of these small specimens because you have limited amounts of tissue to start with. So how do you collect an adequate sample? Well, for one, using an image-guided technique um, will give you a better diagnostic yield because if you can see where your needle is and your needle is in the lesion, chances are you will collect a better sample with more diagnostic material. Now, I cannot emphasize enough that optimizing the technique in terms of what needle gauge to use, the number of FNA passes, number of core needle biopsies um, that you need to take, um, who is doing the procedure, the expertise of the operator, all of these little factors do come into play um, in ensuring that you're collecting an adequate sample. Now, the College of American Pathologists actually got together with um, various different professional societies that included pathologists, uh, radiologists, pulmonologists, and molecular uh, pathologists to come up with a guideline in terms of collecting and handling these thoracic small biopsy and cytology specimens for biomarker studies. And um, the guideline was just recently published in the Archives of um, Pathology and Lab Medicine. And I was uh, fortunate to be involved in this whole process. And so I have put in the reference if you wanted to, if you haven't seen this yet, um, this would be a good resource to refer to in terms of collecting adequate tissue for these patients. And um, I will go over some of the recommendations, like the key recommendations that pertain to lung cancer um, and um, how it impacts some of the testing we do downstream. So um, here's uh, recommendations number one, two, six, and nine. And all of these kind of pertain to the collection of tissue. So um, there's a strong recommendation for using EBUS guided transbronchial needle aspirations when available for the initial evaluation, diagnosis, staging, um, for recurrence and metastatic lesions, for mediastinal and hyaline lymph nodes, as well as centrally located parenchymal lesions that are visible with ultrasound. Um, as far as EBUS procedures, um, needle gauges of 19, 21, and 22 can all be used. Um, the 19 gauge needle, uh, we had limited data, but showed um, similar yields as far as biomarker testing goes. Um, as far as the transthoracic procedures, so these are this is your go-to procedure for anything, um, uh, any peripheral um, pulmonary lesions. Um, the needle size um, should be um, up to the operator and the technique, um, but based on the systematic uh, review that we did um, of the literature review, needles as small as 25 gauge uh, for FNAs and as small as 20 gauge for the core needle biopsies seem to give adequate yield for biomarker studies. If performing bronchoscopy for the peripheral lesions that are difficult to reach by conventional bronchoscopy, image guidance uh, may be used if it's available to the operator. So overall, um, for all of these procedures, um, the use of image guidance, if available, is uh, recommended. The second thing that came out of the guideline was the recommendations for the use of rapid on-site evaluation. The use of rows during an FNA procedure can ensure adequate sampling and the appropriate triage of that sample for downstream testing. So depending on what I'm seeing um, at the time of rows, we can triage the additional passes in anticipation for biomarker testing. 
So if I'm at an institution where my molecular lab will only test from blocks, I will minimize the amount of material on the smears and maximize everything into the needle rinse with the hopes of getting a good cell block that will be adequate for all the IHC, the molecular and fish studies that I will need. So for example, um, here's a patient, 72 year old female, has a history of lung adenocarcinoma, now has enlarging lymph nodes, um, suspicious for carcinoma, so they schedule a neck FNA for, um, and before they schedule the FNA, they also put in the requisition that this is for biomarker testing. Now, we do the FNA, I'm doing the rapid onsite, and I see this. There's no metastatic carcinoma, there's a monomorphic population of lymphoid cells. I'm worried about um, a lymphoid uh, proliferation, so in a patient who's 72, possibly um, some kind of low-grade B-cell lymphoma. So I can kind of triage that tissue, um, and I can send it for flow at the time, and I can make a cell block so I can do the markers. I also recommend that they do a core biopsy if needed, and then based on what I have on my cell block or the core biopsy, um, we can do immunohistochemical markers, we have additional flow, and we're able to give a diagnosis of a low-grade B-cell lymphoma consistent with follicular lymphoma. So what I see at the time of the procedure at ROSE kind of decides how I'm going to triage that tissue. So what are the recommendations that we have from this guideline uh, pertaining to ROSE? So recommendations 3, 5, and 10. So the first one is for EBIS uh, TBNAs, ROSE should be used if available. Um, for transthoracic procedures, this is a strong recommendation that ROSE should be used um, if available and clinically feasible. And if you are doing a core biopsy where there is no concurrent FNA, a touch prep, touch prep may be used for adequacy assessment. As far as transbronchial needle aspirates, ROSE should again be used for adequacy if available. And if you're doing a transbronchial uh, forceps biopsy where there is no FNA uh, concurrent, um, the use of touch preparations can be utilized to do the adequacy assessment. Additional guidelines that pertain to rows and collection of adequate tissue for biomarker studies are recommendations four, seven, and eight. So recommendation four states to achieve optimal diagnostic yield when performing EBUS tBNA without rows, the bronchoscopist should perform at a minimum three and up to five passes if technically and clinically feasible. When performing with rows, obviously clinical judgment should be used to decide the number of passes. Additional passes may be required um, if you're doing ancillary studies. For transthoracic FNAs without a corneal biopsy, the recommendation is that the proceduralist obtains multiple passes, if possible, to collect enough material for a tissue block. And again, we talked about this um, at the beginning that the ease of getting multiple sections from the block um, make it the substrate of choice for IHC markers, fish, and other studies that can be uh, that are needed for patient care. And then, lastly, um, to achieve optimal diagnostic yield when performing transthoracic core biopsies, the proceduralist should attempt to obtain a minimum of three core samples if feasible. Um, if it's clinically feasible, technically possible, additional samples can be taken if needed for ancillary studies. So, so far we've been talking about the specimen acquisition and collection part and how we can optimize these procedures to get the best sample. So let's move on to the specimen processing part next. So from the guidelines, we have two more recommendations that pertain to processing um, and handling. And these are recommendations number 12 and 13. The first is a strong recommendation that cytology specimens, which include smear cell blocks, liquid-based cytology, may be used for ancillary studies as long as they're supported by validation studies. Um, and then core needle biopsies when collected for ancillary studies should be fixed in 10% neutral buffered formalin. Why um, the emphasis on specimen processing is mainly because depending on how the specimen is processed, you can have quantitative and qualitative differences 
in not just the nucleic acid, but also the protein antigenicity. So if you look at an FNA procedure, you take a sample, you can put some of the sample onto a glass slide, smear it out, and stain it, but then you have the remaining sample in the needle, and there is like a dizzying array of choices that you have. Um, do you fix the sample in formalin? Do you put it in alcohol? Do you put it in one of the liquid-based cytology preservatives? Um, if you're making a smear, do you air dry it? Do you alcohol fix it? So there's a multitude of ways you can process the specimen. And depending on how you process it, you may or may not get the most adequate amount of nucleic acid content. And here's a paper that I really like showing at different um, conferences, not to highlight what is the best way to process a specimen, but more to show that depending on how you process it, you may get quantitative differences in the amount of DNA yield that you get. And so in this study, um, the authors actually compared different methods of fixation using alcohol or air dried, um, different kinds of um, preservatives, um, ethanol versus cytolite versus cytorich red, which, which are like some of the liquid-based cytology preservatives, as well as the mounting medium that's used to cover slip these um, slides. And they showed that you can have varying amounts of DNA yield. And it's important because the DNA yield um, plays a big role in the success of some of your molecular testing that you will do on these samples. And it's not just the cytology specimen. That's also true for the FFPE samples, which are your core biopsies and your cytology cell blocks. And this paper actually highlights that there are multiple factors that actually affect your FFPE tissue. And some of the most, um, the best characterized factors include ischemic time, how long it takes you to put the specimen into a fixative, how long you fix it in the fixative, um, and how you process it in terms of if it's a bone specimen, your decalcification, how you store it and embed it. And this nicely summarizes some of the findings in this uh, review article in terms of the different factors and how they play a role in the quality of the DNA, RNA, and protein that we will be extracting from these tissues. And um, again, some of these are part of different guidelines that we currently have in terms of the ischemic time, how long you put it in a fixative. The recommendation, of course, is to always fix in neutral buffered formalin um, and not more than um, 72 hours. Um, if you're doing a decalcification on a bone specimen, the recommendation is to use EDTA and not a harsh acid that will be incompatible with molecular testing. So moving on to the specimen selection and handling portion, again, this is critical because knowing um, what kind of specimen is being accepted by the molecular lab that you're using, what kind of criteria they use for specimen acceptance, what kind of tissue extraction strategies they use, um, what kind of platform they're using. All of these things actually are important in terms of deciding which is the best specimen for testing. So when it comes to reviewing a specimen and sending it for testing, there's a couple of things to keep in mind. One is the overall cellularity of the specimen. We're talking about small specimens here, so you're not gonna have a ton of material. But the overall cellularity is important because this is what translates to the amount of DNA or RNA yield you will get out of that specimen. And a question that keeps coming up um, when we have a radiologist doing a procedure, they will always come and ask, we need these tests um, done on this sample. How many cells do you need? So I always say that, um, a cell has about six or seven picograms of DNA. So if you're gonna do a test um, that needs like one nanogram of DNA, you need like 143, 166 intact cells. So an NGS assay, which requires about 10 nanograms of DNA, would need like about 1,500 intact cells. Now you need to keep in mind that, of course, when you're trying to scrape off cells from a slide, you're probably not gonna get the entire cell, maybe not the entire nuclei. But in the ballpark, a few thousand cells is what you need for some of these assays. So the second important thing in terms of evaluating a specimen is the tumor cellularity. 
which is the percentage of tumor cells you have relative to all the other cells you have in the background. And this is important because this is what translates to the analytic sensitivity of the platform you're using for the molecular assay. So assuming most tumors are heterozygous, um, when you look at the tumor sample that has about 40% tumor, so 40% of the cells have tumor cells, only 20% are mutant alleles in the specimen. So you need a test with a sensitivity of at least 20% to reliably pick out that mutant allele. So the lower your tumor fraction, the more sensitive your test needs to be. So if you have a sample that has um, a 10% tumor cellularity, you need a test with a 5% sensitivity to be able to pick that mutant allele out. So the analytic sensitivity of a platform is basically the lowest limit of detection of the assay. And so when you have a specimen, there's two ways of handling it. One, you can modulate the test platform to match the specimen at hand, or you can modulate the specimen to match the testing platform. So how do you modulate the testing platform? So basically you select a platform, which is a high sensitivity assay, um, to evaluate specimens that have low tumor fraction in, in, in the specimen. So for example, here uh, on the left, you have a melanoma sample. Um, pretty much all the cells in here are tumors, so your tumor fraction is really high. This assay sensitivity is not really an issue here. However, the tumor on the right, you have tumor cells, but they're dispersed among a lot of benign cells, so you have a low tumor fraction samples. So it's critical for a sample like this to get tested on something that's a high sensitivity assay. Otherwise, you run the risk of a false negative result. So to show an example of how this matters, um, I have a case here um, that was highlighted to me because this patient um, has a known EGFR mutation. It's a lung adenocarcinoma patient, was on tyrosine kinase inhibitors, and they were clinically suspecting resistance. A uh, patient had presented with a new pleural effusion, and they wanted us to test the effusion to see if we could pick out the resistance mutation. And I got a call um, that says that, hey, what happened? Because the test results came back, and it says there's no mutation detected. But we know this patient has a known EGFR mutation, so what went wrong? If you look at the PATH report, it says like PCR-based um, analysis. So this was done by Sanger sequencing, which has one of the lowest sensitivities. Like um, you need at least like 30, 40% tumor in a sample to be able to detect a mutation by Sanger. And this was tested by Sanger, so obviously this result was a false negative result. So we <clears throat> took this sample and we re-ran it on our next-gen sequencing assay. And um, not only were we able to see the um, EGFR exon 19 deletion, which was the known sensitizing mutation in this patient, as seen here on the left, um, we were also able to detect the T790M mutation, which was the resistance mutation that they were worried about clinically and um, that was in, present in the sample at a lower, like a, in a subclonal population at a lower allelic frequency. So it's critical that we pick the right platform when we're testing some of these samples, um, especially when you have a low tumor fraction sample. So I mentioned the other way you can handle your specimen. One of the ways to do it is to try and enrich for tumors. So if you have a sample like this where <clears throat> you have tumor, but you also have a lot of benign cells, we try and circle an area that's enriched in tumor to increase the tumor content and exclude areas that have a lot of benign cells that would dilute the tumor content. So the last thing I wanted to mention is how best to triage these small specimens. I mentioned that there is always this debate about whether to do a core biopsy or an FNA procedure, but in my opinion, these are complementary procedures. Um, there are advantages to each of these techniques, and we can use them to our advantage when, when it comes to biomarker testing. At our institution, um, we reflex most of our tests, uh, the biomarker testing to our histology specimens, so on the core needle biopsies, and if we have um, a 
a, a patient sample where it's inadequate on the core biopsy or we don't have a core biopsy, we reflex that uh, test request to the cytology specimens. So uh, we did a study where we looked at the number of cases that we tested um, using our cytology specimens, and about 30% of the cases were because the core biopsy was inadequate for testing. In most of these samples, we were able to get all the biomarker testing that was requested, which goes on to show that, you know, um, if possible, do both get a concurrent FNA and a core biopsy so that you can use both samples, especially in this current scenario where we have to do biomarker testing on so many different um, for so many different markers, that it makes sense that we would combine these specimens to be able to get you the results that are needed. So to highlight that, I have this um, specimen here, um, lung adenocarcinoma uh, sample that came in for biomarker testing for lung cancer. And here's the core needle biopsy. And as you can see, most of it was kind of necrotic and fibrotic, no tumor cells. And off on the edge of one of the little cores was a little bit of tumor. Here's the concurrent FNA um, specimen. You have the cell block on the left and the smears on the right. And here's the list of um, biomarkers that were requested on this patient. So they wanted us to do the NGS mutation analysis for EGFR, BRAF, and KRAS, uh, fish testing for ALKROS1, RET, and MET, and then IHC for PDL1, MSI testing, a lot of different things. Um, and here we have this limited amount of tissue. So if I had to triage the specimen, this is what um, we would end up doing. So you have the mutation assay, fish, and IHC. You have the core biopsy, the cell block from the cytology, and the smears. So Given the limited amount of tissue we have on the core biopsy, I would probably triage this for my IHC markers and fish testing. Because for um, PDL1, we only need about 100 cells. Um, you can get serial sections cut from this block, and you can use it for the four fish assays they have asked for. And then for the mutation assay, I would use the cell block or the smears, both of which are abundantly cellular, have really good um, tumor fraction and would be more than adequate for the NGS assay that we would do. The other key thing to remember is that communication is key. Um, we need to have a clear communication between the oncologist who is ordering the test, the radiologist, the lab techs prep, uh, who are preparing the specimen, and the pathologist. Because the last thing you want is to have a specimen like this that you need for biomarker testing and then the diagnosis is made, um, and then they ask for the biomarker testing. We recut the block, and this is what's left on it. So if we know upfront what is being uh, requested of the specimen, you can probably cut unstained sections right up front without having to reface that block. And so communication is a critical part of this whole biomarker testing scenario. So in conclusion, what I wanted to highlight is that small specimens are not an obstacle for testing. However, there are multiple factors that play a role in how that tissue is collected and handled and how it will behave for downstream testing. And so appropriate triaging of the tissue and handling of the tissue can improve the success of biomarker testing. And to do that, we have to be part of the clinical team to be an integrative diagnostician. So you have to have the clinical, radiologic, molecular, and path pathologic correlation to be able to put all of these little components together and get the best biomarker testing for the small specimens that we typically get for lung cancer. So thank you so much for being here today. Stay safe, and I am happy to answer any questions that you have. Thank you. Thank you. That was uh, that was wonderful and very comprehensive. And um, we do have two questions for you. Um, the first one is: Is there a difference? Here we are. Is there a difference between EBIS and a CT guided biopsy in terms of yield? Um, in in our experience, um, we haven't seen that much of a difference. Um, we did a study where we looked at the yield in terms of biomarker testing, 
And as far as FNAs go, they were very similar. Um, we did a recent RNA-based study, and in that, um, there was a little bit of difference in terms of the results we had between the core biopsies versus the FNAs, but um, as far as when we compare the FNAs, they're very similar. Great. And um, is rapid on-site assessment practical in smaller community hospitals, and can AI help? <laughs> So, so the, this is a very contentious topic. Um, I mean, if you ask two pathologists um, their view on the use of um, rapid on-site assessment, you'll get two different answers. And part of it has to do with um, that it, it, it's a kind of, it's a tedious procedure. Um, it's not well reimbursed. Um, so it's a, um, it, it's resource intensive in terms of time um, and, and the personnel. And so if you, if you ask whether it helps with getting an adequate sample, yes, it does. But uh, there's no question about that. The problem is that, as you mentioned, like in smaller hospitals, they may not have the infrastructure to do that for every single procedure. So the, this, the CAP guidelines, when we were focusing on how do you collect for um, ancillary studies, um, it, it, what we recommended and what the expert opinion was that in cases where you anticipate that there will be a requirement for biomarker studies, if you have it available to utilize it, because you want to make sure that in that first try that you get an adequate sample and you don't have to resort to doing a repeat biopsy. But yes, it's, it is problematic um, to have a person doing it um, at the time of the procedure. A lot of places have started using telepathology. So even if the person is not there physically, um, you do the procedure, um, they make the slides, and, and we actually are doing it at our institution for some of the uh, satellite locations because there's not that many procedures to have a person there full time during the procedure, but we look at it um, on our computer while the procedure's going on. But yes, you need somebody at, you know, real time to be able to do that part. Fascinating. That's great. Thank you very much for your time and expertise. We really appreciate it.